You might think that you don't need to know about statistics, but you also might think that there's not going to be some huge pandemic that just rolls through town and ruins everything. And we all saw how that went. In all seriousness, stats is related to everything that you care about in life. You want to get into a good school, make more money, have better relationships, you name it, there's research on it. And stats is the language of research. If you can speak this language, then you can evaluate research on your own. But if you can't, then you'll forever be at the mercy of people who can. So in this video, we're going to learn about stats and take the first baby steps towards intellectual independence. In general, there are two types of data you need to know, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data is something that that you can quantify. So stuff like correlational data, experiment results, or even a failing test score in your psychology class. All of these are examples of numeric data, so it's quantitative. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is non-numeric data. So this includes things like interview transcripts, field note recordings, or the explanation that that person comes up with for why they failed that test. Okay, now let's look at some things that we can do with quantitative data. With quantitative data, you can utilize descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive stats can be used to better understand data that you have, like a complete data set. So I could figure out the class average in my site class because I've got all that data. Now, if I wanna figure out the GPA of all of grade 11, that's a different situation. I don't have all the data. I need to take a sample and then make some inferences. In other words, I need to use inferential statistics. Okay, let's figure out exactly what descriptive statistics are though. The two main types of descriptive stats are the measures of central tendency and the measures of variation. The measures of central tendency are the mean, median, and mode. You probably already know about these from math class, but I'll explain why they're useful in different situations here. Let's start with the mean, which is just an average. We can quickly figure out the average height of a class by adding everyone's height together, then dividing by the number of students. Pretty easy. But now let's pretend that Aaron Yeager is in your class, and after transforming into his attack titan, he's suddenly 49 feet tall. Because of that one super tall data point, your class average height is now well over seven feet. That's not good. None of you are seven feet tall. Outliers can really distort averages, so this is a weakness of the mean. In this situation, it's better to use the median, which is just the data point that's closest to the middle of the range. The median is useful because it's not affected by outliers. Okay, the last measure of central tendency is the mode. The mode is just the most common response. So the mode is great to use when you have nominal data. And you can think of nominal data like different categories. Like if we had people vote on their favorite ice cream flavor, the mode would tell you which one's the most popular. All right, so that's measures of central tendency. Now let's talk about variability. Variability will tell you how spread out data points are in a data set. There are two main measures of variability, range and variance. The range is pretty simple. It's just calculated as the difference between the highest and lowest values in a data set. Variance is a measure of how much individual data points deviate from the mean in a data set. So how far are they from the average? To understand variance, we need to know what a normal distribution is and what z-scores are. A normal distribution, also known as a bell curve, is a statistical concept that is usually used to describe data that clusters around an average. Height also happens to be a great example of something that is normally distributed. So what's that mean? Well, it means that average heights are pretty common. Most people have an average height. But extreme heights, like very tall people or very short people, are rather uncommon. So when you put the data on a chart, it kind of forms this curve that looks like a bell. In normal distributions, 99.7% of values lie between negative three and three standard deviations, 95% between negative two and two standard deviations, and 68% between negative one and one standard deviation. And these numbers that indicate the deviation are called z-scores. Z-scores are useful for understanding if a data point is an outlier or not. So if something has a z-score that's above three, then you know that that data point is really, really uncommon. It's almost certainly an outlier. Now, sometimes this bell curve gets a little bit messed up and you get what's called a skewed distribution. A skewed distribution is basically a bell curve that looks distorted because more data points are falling on one side than the other. In a positively skewed distribution, the tail on the right-hand side is longer or stretched compared to the tail on the left-hand side. The majority of data points are concentrated towards the lower values, and you have some outliers that are pulling the tail to the right on the high end of the scale. Negative skew goes the opposite way. In a negatively skewed distribution, the tail on the left-hand side of the distribution is longer compared to the tail on the right-hand side. The majority of data points are concentrated towards the higher end on the right, and the outliers are pulling the lower tail to the left. Okay, that's skewed distributions. 
Another way we can look at data is by using something called percentile rank. Oh, look at this, got some plants now, big plant guy, huh? Aren't you the gym bro from the bias video? We're kind of in the middle of something. Yep, guess how tall I am. I really don't think anyone cares. Wrong, I'm six foot three. Do you know what percentile rank that puts me in? Cool dude, do you even know what percentile rank is? Oh ye of little faith. Of course I know what it is. Being six foot three puts me in the 98th percentile of men in the US, which means I'm taller than 98% of guys in America. Okay, one, you shouldn't brag about something that you didn't work for. And two, I kinda hate to say it, but he's right. That is what percentile rank means. If you're in the 10th percentile, then your score is only higher than 10% of the scores in a data set. If you're in the 90th percentile, then your score is higher than 90% of the scores in a data set. Okay, hang in there, just two more concepts. In a previous video, we talked about the correlations a little bit. A correlation coefficient is a measure that tells you the strength and direction of a relationship between two variables. It's represented with the letter R, and it can range from negative one to positive one, where negative one indicates a very strong negative correlation, and positive one indicates a very strong positive correlation. And zero means there's no relationship between the variables. So a positive correlation means that as one variable goes up, the other variable tends to go up as well. Negative correlation means that as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. Last but not least, we've got p-values. P-values are kind of the holy grail in research. In statistics, a p-value or probability value will tell you if your results are statistically significant. So what's that mean? Well, that means that the independent variable is most likely what caused a change in the dependent variable. And establishing that is oftentimes the goal of doing research. If P is less than 0.05, that means there's a 95% chance that the independent variable is what's caused the change in the dependent variable. So if you get a p-value below 0.05, then you can at least reject the null hypothesis, which states that the independent variable doesn't do anything. Getting statistically significant results doesn't necessarily prove that your hypothesis is true, but you can be confident that you're on the right track. Okay, that's all we've got for stats. In our next video, we're gonna take a look at the ethical regulations in psychological research.